Welcome back. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Mark Larimore from the New School of Social Research. He is Professor of Religious Studies and he is also the Director of the Religious Studies Program. And the title of his paper is Leibniz the Odyssey as a Metaphysics for Lit Religion. Thank you. Try not to go over. It's a real, I guess I'm not talking into this. I, I can talk any way I want now. It's a real pleasure to be here today. It has, as I mentioned two days ago, been some days, some time since I occupied myself with Leibniz. I've spent the last dozen years in my home field, the academic study of religion. And while I have continued to work on the history of Western engagement with problems of evils, I've been spending less and less time with philosophers. Instead, moved in part by the Academy's move slowly but progressively to awareness of the post-secular situation in which we find ourselves, I've been drawn to a new academic movement called lived religion. In the words of its most prominent advocate, historian Robert Orsi, this approach seeks to understand, quote, religion as people actually do and imagine it in their circumstances of their everyday lives. In the US, this is a movement largely of historians and social scientists, although it has some resonances with a movement in German practical theology of the same name, which distinguishes Geliebte from Geliebte Religion. What it doesn't, at first glance, seem to have is very much appreciation for the work of philosophers. I'm trying to discern, with its help, new ways and more grounded ways of understanding the contributions of philosophical reflection, reason giving, speculation, and systematization in the ongoing lives of religions. I should ask, by the way, is this microphone working or am I yes, yes. fading in and out because I fade in and out from my own hearing? The topic I have chosen for today's talk tries to bring the world of lived religion and into conversation with the world of Leibniz's theodicy. For a rationalist, Leibniz was unusually attentive to the sorts of things which scholars of lived religion care about. From an instinctive eclecticism and a profound sense of the irreducible particularity of the particular, to his appreciation for the value of well-grounded phenomena and the powers of vernacular language. In what follows, I want to suggest that he may be the metaphysician for the worlds of lived religion. Nevertheless, the topic I propose to discuss is a provocation in at least three ways. First, thinking about Leibniz and religion is perhaps not as startling as it might have been a generation ago, and we have learned to see that the theodicy in particular um, should be read in the context of Leibniz's decades-long effort to bring about a reunification of the Christian churches. But Leibniz and lived religion. Leibniz may have understood all of his activities as a sort of religious practice for the greater glory of God and his creation, but his support for specifically religious practices seems to have verged on nil. In any case, the theodicy certainly seems very far removed from that level of doing the Lord's business, at least the way in which it is commonly read. I will try to read it differently. Second provocation. Scholars emphasizing the significance of lived religion are bound to look askance at the idea that lived religion needs a metaphysics, let alone one as glib as Leibniz's argument that this is the best of all possible worlds. As we heard again last night, this has long been understood as one of the most egregious examples of what William James once called a block universe view of the world, a monolithic metaphysical view which crushes the lived value and struggle of into actual individual human existence in time. Here too, I will suggest a somewhat different reading. Finally, it is a provocation to suggest that Leibniz's theodicy might be an effective metaphysics for lived religion in Lisbon the city whose destruction by earthquake, tsunami, and fire 250 years ago is widely seen as having destroyed the pretensions not only of Leibniz's theodicy, but of any theodicy. Lisbon's effects on the history of theodicy have, I fear, been greatly exaggerated. But this only makes greater the temerity of bringing a discussion of living theodicy here. As many of us have, I have been aware throughout our delightful time here of the new questions posed to us by the dead of that day of 1755. I hope nothing I say lessens the tragedy of their deaths and those of their countless fellows across the centuries. So I don't make these provocations lightly. My hope is that we really think through what we have long known, that Leibniz was a man of practice and not only of theory, and try to understand his argument that this is the best of all possible worlds in that context, the context of Leibniz in practice. 
The history of the Lisbon earthquake actually provides a, not a bad way into these questions. We've all heard the apocryphal story of the response of the future of Marquis de Pombal to the distraught Portuguese King José in the immediate aftermath of the Tembler to what one of our guides yesterday called our dumb king, to King José's confused question, what is to be done to meet this infliction of divine justice? Pombal is reputed to have replied, bury the dead and feed the living. My argument in a nutshell is that the stance attributed to the Marquis, a sort of pragmatic bypassing of questions of divine justice in history, is what Leibniz sought to promote throughout his life and in the theodicy especially. Our book, The Theodicy, is a sort of prophylactic against just the sorts of theories of judgment which were paralyzing our dumb king. Unlike Pope's spectatorial optimism, Leibniz's best of all possible worlds argument is all about making practical distinctions, I think. Distinctions for action about what is live and what is dead. A discernment required continually in ethical life, even in the best of all possible worlds. Unlike Voltaire's pedant Pangloss, Leibniz would never say, all is for the best in this best of all possible worlds, let alone with Pope, whatever is, is right. All is, in fact, for the best, making whatever is truly right, but we cannot occupy the vantage point from which these claims can be made. If we make them, as reactionary as general claims, they are reactionary platitudes. If we try to particularize them, we not only usurp but bowdlerize divine judgments, which being based in infinitely infinite calculations, we could never comprehend. I'll talk first a little bit about the term lived religion in recent religious studies before offering some thoughts then on Leibniz's theodicy as engaged with this level of religion and as a resource for it. Lived religion encompasses what has variously in the past been described as lay religion, vernacular religion, popular religion, unofficial religion, but it is not restricted to it. These earlier categories often bracket out, for methodological or ideological reasons, the work of elite religion, including the work of religious intellectuals. Lived religion, while not without a polemical side, is more Catholic, small c. It is a widening of focus and a change of perspective in our understanding of how religious systems are generated and maintained. You can represent it as a change from attention to what's said in pulpits, like this, to what's heard in pews, and what's done then in the lives of the people in the pews with whatever it is that they've taken from what was said. Lived religion finds that religious life is characterized not by faithful following or consistent theologies, but by creative appropriation and adaptation and no small piece of syncretism. In general, one can see the focus on lived religion as a reaction to past studies of religion, which focused exclusively on sacred texts, theological systems, and their ordained interpreters. When ritual was considered, for example, it was read as a text as well. Past scholars noticed in passing that the folks in the pews seemed not to be listening very carefully, but they accepted the pulpiteer's account of what was going on. Lay people were poor listeners, poor custodians of their own religious lives, who muddled concepts, cut corners, and too often lost sight of the seriousness of what was at issue, they said. But the pews are neither as attentive as preachers wish, nor as disengaged as they fear. Ordinary religious devotees aren't just the passive recipients of authorized teaching, which they then faithfully, but perhaps poorly, act out, but the co-creators and sustainers of living, of living traditions. As Orsi has put it, there is no religion that people have not taken up in their hands. The lived religion approach sees religious creativity, another phrase of Orsi's, happening at all levels. Some of lived religion is a pretty shabby story of going through the motions, fixes, and fiddles, but the same surely can be said of many sermons. Moving beyond the presumption that gelebte religion should look like gelebte religion, the lived religion approach sees religious seriousness and insight in the ways people live out traditions in their everyday lives. Lived religious bricolage can be as serious as any theological tome, it suggests. The authority of this bricolage comes not from, not from religious centers, but from its power and effectiveness in experience. Lived religion is syncretic, but this is because it accesses resources and experiences as broadly as it can not, of course, necessarily excluding those official religious sources which claim a monopoly on the relevant information. And it is serious because it speaks from and to the ruptures of real lives, those moments when the world we thought we knew seems to fall apart. I might add that there are ruptures of a positive nature as well, 
when we find that our confidence in the order of things has been too timid, but that's a subject for another occasion. Orsi describes this religious creativity as world-making, a slippery but valuable term. It suggests that in their everyday religious lives, people are doing more than making do, tweaking, patching. Especially in moments of rupture, they are imagining and fashioning and refashioning worlds, worlds of relationship and agency to human and non-human partners, and in a way in which they can live out their ideals and also live with their losses. But these worlds are human-sized, not cosmos-sized. Max Weber famously argued that religious intellectuals are driven to make of the world a meaningful cosmos, meaning all of it, a view updated and democratized in Peter Berger's idea of theodicy as a sacred canopy in his book of that name from 1969. Um, a sacred canopy demanded and sustained by a whole society, else chaos will come storming in. It seems, however, that people get by and even flourish in much smaller scale worlds which the sociologist Christian Smith has called sacred umbrellas. And I'll just quote a passage from Smith because I can't say it better than he. Canopies are expansive, immobile, and held up by props beyond the reach of those covered. Umbrellas, on the other hand, are small, handheld, and portable, like the faith-sustaining religious worlds that modern people construct for themselves. We suggest that as the old overarching sacred canopies split apart and their ripped pieces fell toward the ground, Many innovative religious actors caught those falling pieces of cloth in the air and with more than a little ingenuity, remanufactured them into umbrellas. In the pluralistic modern world, people don't need <coughs> macro-encompassing sacred cosmoses to maintain their religious beliefs. They only need what we might call sacred umbrellas, small, portable, accessible, relational worlds, religious reference groups, under which their beliefs can make complete sense. These worlds are not individual bubbles, but social worlds, and as I said, they include not only human members. The study of lived religion has made clear that even in the same family or the same religious order, individuals lead subtly or dramatically different religious lives, making different things of the same traditions, the same teachings, the same practices, and that this variation is known and to a greater or lesser degree accepted. Shared religious worlds are stable without being uniform. Recognizing and honoring the differences between situations and between individuals negotiating their way through them. They know that ruptures open up in predictable but also in unpredictable places and that people make their way through them or beyond them in different ways that will require ingenuity and resources. It is true that lived religion does not reveal much concern with intellectual consistency, but this isn't always the short-sighted narcissistic shallowness charged by pulpit religion. It's another kind of order or harmony more perhaps like a consistency of practices. An ad hoc fix might get you off a little problem, get you out of a little problem, but something broader and broader based is needed for speaking from and to rupture situations. Can't rebuild the world, just enough detail. Religious world making creativity doesn't make the next action possible, but action itself possible, intelligible, meaningful. There is a stable coherence here, difficult to articulate, but that I take to be my task, that there's more that is more like a shared store of stories, idealized, mythical, anecdotal, a kind of toolkit of scenarios. This is the philosophical moment, I think, in lived religion. It turns out to be quite different from the systems and certainties of most theodicies, but also of the hand-waving mysteries of faith solutions that simply pull a curtain of mystery across our questions. It reorients and restores agency by offering multiple interpretations of a rupture situation this might be like what Jesus meant in the parable of the sower, one might say, in one of these cases. Or, or also, this looks like what happened when Uncle Fred tried his hand at silver mining. Uncle Fred? It's not, for once for, it's not interested in once for all explanation, but repeated use and reuse, learning from mistakes as well as experimentation. It expects variation. Um, it encourages it. Um, it weaves it together. The lived religion approach provides a more grounded framework also for understanding philosophical and ethical reflection in the life of religions. Lived religion is the level at which values and codes are hashed out, repurposed or abandoned, in settings where people give and seek not only stories, but reasons. And while the everyday is the locus of attention, the lived religion scholar does not restrict her interest to lay or unofficial practice. To notice that the elaboration of consistent philosophical views tends to happen outside situations of tumult and grief is not necessarily to delegitimate them. 
As Orsi again says, the study of lived religion directs attention to institutions and persons, texts and rituals, practice and theology, things and ideas, all as media of making and unmaking worlds. But this is a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose periphery is nowhere. The attention to lived religion and its significance is in some ways the religious studies correlate to a move to social history and the ethnographic turn, turn in the humanities more generally. But it is buoyed also by more religious studies specific debates about the appropriateness of using categories largely developed in liberal Protestant settings in analyzing religious traditions from elsewhere. There's also a salutary caution about unwittingly taking the side of elites in struggles over the integrity and meaning of traditions, the pulpits versus the pews. The study of lived religion in the United States has tended to focus particularly on the history of Catholicism, long showered with the same condescension and scorn which you will find if you read any of the sermons from London in response to the Lisbon earthquake. We don't want to take the divines aside in pronouncing some kinds of religion more true, more advanced than others. Another context is more relevant to our proceedings here today. Over the last few decades, the study of comparative religion has been struggling to come to terms with something that has not happened namely secularization. The secularization we were promised has not materialized. Religion is neither dead nor dying. Lived religion has assisted, that's part of the it's alive part of lived religion. Lived religion has assisted in challenging dismissing, dismissive interpretations um, of enduring and new religious phenomena as mere holdovers, atavisms, reactions, denials, zombies. The decades of special pleading have not ended, and I confess that it is often very difficult in practice to talk about a current religious revival without falling into the language of one or other secularization theory. It happens to me all the time. As Jose Casanova has argued, secularization assumptions are built into the, into the frameworks of all of our academic disciplines. I don't need to point out that we are here at one of the nodes of one of those frameworks, or many of them. The 1755 Lisbon earthquake was thought to have spelled the end of religious theodicy and so of religious normativity in the interpretation of natural and historical events. Some still saw God's hand in it directly or after the fact, but most saw the callousness of such claims and moved toward what Otto Marquardt has called atheism for the greater glory of God. Once taken seriously, the problem of evil is so great that the only way to save God from responsibility for it is to evacuate him from the scene entirely except it didn't happen that way. What you might call Theodicy 1.0 was already in a bad way by the middle of the 18th century. The earthquake didn't trigger a change. And the Kantian Theodicy 2.0 and the philosophies of history, which you might call Theodicy 3.0, were just around the corner. The idea that Lisbon knocked Leibniz out is actually part of Theodicy's 2.0 and 3.0. Theodicy changed, it didn't go away, as religion changed but neither has simply vanished, collapsing under the weight of its own implausibility, its own inadequacy to the challenge of making sense of human life. So we find ourselves now in a moment some call post-secular and can see the rise of secularization theory itself now as coinciding with a particular period in history which has passed or is passing. Sociologist Meredith McGuire puts it in the term, puts it in the context of that period from 1850 to 1950 when Western churches were most successfully and publicly centralized and most vocally engaged in public life as explicitly religious voices. The culmination of a longer term process of religious centralization and sacralization going back to the 14th and 15th century. But that period, a period of centralization, or churching as some people call it, has now ended. Some parts of secularization theory are generally accepted to have been borne out, specifically a precipitous fall in attendance of established churches, that is state churches, and relatedly the functional differentiation of economic, political, legal, educational, and other spheres articulated in forms now entirely unrelated to religion. Or perhaps not entirely so, but that's the theory. For its part, the theodicy problem has been an important character in secularization narratives from Weber to Blumenberg, but to my knowledge, nobody has slotted the history of the theodicy problematic <coughs> itself into this story although some of us have been talking about what we call the historicity of theodicy for a long time. What has been called the discourse of theodicy, the idea that the problem of evil is a serious, perhaps the most serious problem for all religion and demands a philosophically demonstrated answer in order for religion to be able even to show its face, seems to me to be an enlightenment project. 
Theodicy is specifically modern, as Marquardt put it. Where there is theodicy, there is modernity, and where there is modernity, there is theodicy. Evil and suffering have always been religious problems, of course. More so, again, Marquardt reminds us, in pre-modern periods when there was generally more of both. But it is a modern thing to engage it in terms of God's competence as a creator and sustainer. The form of the question, while going back, perhaps, to Epicurus or to uh, the skeptics, um, it's sort of foreign to most of the Western tradition. What if the discourse of theodicy is part of the complex of structures and intellectual frameworks of the age now ending or ended of secularization? The shift from Berger's sacred canopy to Smith's sacred umbrellas is indicative or symptomatic. The structural differentiation which has separated religious from other value spheres and rationalities seems to support religious subcultures creating religious worlds of their own whose different takes on the nature and purpose of evil seem able to coexist remarkably well with neighbors, with members of your own family, with people in your own workplace. The idea of a need for a shared canopy seems very difficult to maintain now. Maybe the odyssey is the atavism, a shadow of an imagined Christendom, nostalgia for a less complicated world. I wonder if our age, and I don't mean like Charles Taylor to assert that everyone in the world is in the same existential situation as Western academic we's are, or bound to be. I wonder if our age is an age without the discourse of theodicy, one in which theodicy has become a local problem for particular individuals and communities to work out for themselves as it arises, in the forms in which it arises. We don't need a canopy precariously maintained by a consonance of social institutions and values, or a church, this does mean, doesn't mean that demand for religious meaning in the whole of experience is weakened in any way. It may indeed be strengthened by the experience of the heterogeneity of other provinces of life. But the horizon, I think, has decisively changed, and perhaps in the direction of something that preceded the rise of the discourse of theodicy. Before I turn to Leibniz, I want to mention one recent contribution to these discussions which I have found helpful, um, both in understanding the rise and fall of secularization theory, and in thinking about the rise and fall of the discourse of theodicy and, on this occasion, for assessing the legacy and continuing relevance of Leibniz's theodicy, our topic at this conference. The theory is that of Peter Beyer, sorry, another sociologist, a specialist in globalization and religion. Beyer suggests that we understand the various value spheres or institutions which the study of functional differentiation has traced to be contingent. In a modern society, there need not necessarily be a religious sphere, distinct from law or from science, for instance, as secularization theories have tended to assume. We can instead see religious and other differentiated systems emerging over time and in time in ways specific to the historical and cultural situations in which they arise. I might mention the multiple modernities theory here as well. If the old model of functional differentiation was of various spheres moving more or less quickly but ineluctably away from the matrix of religion, coming into their own only to find that they had misplaced or displaced religion, it is now pretty clear that Western religion is structured and experienced as a sphere of its own. This historical specificity is one of the main reasons why we theorists of religion have been so ferociously critical of the category. Beyer's contribution is to suggest that since we no longer assume and assert that the religious sphere, the cultural sphere, the scientific sphere, the moral sphere, etc., have timeless universal essences, what they were called Eigengesetzlichkeit, from the Sanskrit, we should be able to see the articulation of spheres in particular contexts not as autonomous, but as emerging simultaneously um, and defining themselves in a reciprocal way, which Bayer calls mutual modeling. Mutual modeling is both contrastive and paralleling at once. The emerging constellation of centralized churches in modern Western societies, most of them explicit or de facto state churches, is best understood, he suggests, by a mutual modeling of state and church during the modern period. For the modern state system, too, was on the make at just this time. Bayer calls the mutual modeling of political and religious spheres Westphalianism. For the 1648 the Treaty of Westphalia's remarkable settlement of quius regio, eus religio. This settlement, Bayer argues, contrasted religion and politics by also making them parallel. Both religious and political community and identity were thought of in the same terms, in terms of exclusive membership. One was a citizen of one state or another, one subscribed to the creeds and practices of one church or another. While strictly distinguished in their purview, this world or the next, both of these communities, political and religious, were seen to serve a similar purpose in making collective action and meaning-making possible 
Each promised access to something more settled and more transcendent than the vagaries of individual lives, which through them received a definition and stability they would have been unable to generate on their own. It is this framework that led both to the now empty state churches and to the definition secularization theorists used to use to trumpet the supposed obsolescence of religion, suggests Bayer. Bayer does not make a connection to the discourse of theodicy, but the connection seems to me ripe for the making. It is the analogy of divine providence with political governance in the Westphalian model that gets the essentially political form of the modern theodicy question going. Bayer's suggestion is that religion has not disappeared, but has gone on with mutual modeling now of other spheres, notably economics and of the mass media, rather than the state. But for our purposes today, what's valuable is the idea that religion not only need not be understood in political terms, but has not always been so even in the West. Bayer is trying to understand what comes after the Westphalian, but I'm interested in what it displaced for the beginning of it happens to fall astride not only of Leibniz's life, but I think of some of Leibniz's most profound concerns. Let me just recap where I hope we've arrived. The lived religion approach, especially once connected to an understanding of historical change, gives us a broader picture of the nature and significance of religion. We see the focus on centralized authority modeled on political state and the expectation of doctrinal, doctrinal consistency and conformity as products of a particular point in modern Western history when an earlier, more pluralistic religious economy, for lack of a better word, was displaced. A religious economy which may once again become relevant as we move into the post-Westphalian age. The worlds created and sustained by lived religion are not indifferent to religious institutions and creeds, etc., but they take them on their own terms as touchstones rather than as centers. The folks in the pews are listening, but they listen to more than preachers and ask different questions than the ones that are mandated for them. They don't just subscribe to a religion, but take it up in their hands. For speaking in and to the ruptures of life, the closed systems developed by specialists in particular proved to be of limited use. We may have materials here for a lived religion account of the changing form of theodicy. The demand for the kind of totalizing account demanded by the discourse of theodicy seems in retrospect to me to be an aberration connected to an anomalous alignment of religious and political structures of power and legitimation, which was confined, incidentally, to the only places where something like textbook secularization in fact happened, namely Northwest Europe and among westernized intellectuals around the world. So you'll have guessed where I'm going to argue, that I'm going to argue that Leibniz is not a participant or even a progenitor of the discourse of theodicy, though he gave it a name. He speaks from and for the worlds which were displaced by that particular kind of modernity with a particular mutual modeling which Bayer describes. After that, I'll suggest that Leibniz's theodicy does more than ward off an unwholesome intellectual project. The theodicy is a toolkit of philosophical scenarios enabling a multiplication of interpretations to help people live with their losses and act and rebuild worlds. More, it explains why we need tools in the first place. It is just as much metaphysics, sorry, it is just as, much metaphysics as we need to support the world making each of us should do and must do as we bury our dead and feed the living possibilities around us. When did we start? Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Leibniz gave, Leibniz gave the discourse of theodicy a name, as I said, but he was not doing theodicy. I follow Patrick Riley in seeing Leibniz's TODC. I'll call it TODC from now on to distinguish it from the discourse of theodicy. The TODC not as primarily about the problem of evil, but rather as a popular introduction to Julius Prudence Universelle. The goodness of God and the freedom of man are its main topics, the origin of evil only contingently so. As the TODC's heart is in, at the TODC's heart, as a newly perspicuous formulation of the hoary old view that this must be the best of all possible worlds. When it comes to explaining just why particular evils exist, however, of course, Leibniz simply refuses. The content of our understanding of particular situations in the world will have to come from somewhere else and can never have the apodictic certainty the discourse of theodicy makes a precondition for the rationality of religious belief. Leibniz's purpose, as is made clear in the preface of the TODC, is not to demonstrate the existence of a god in response to charges from skeptical challenges, but to show why those worries arise and why we should not be tripped up by them. There are real questions out there about the challenge of evils, but it is neither possible nor desirable to give them the kind of final answers which later decades would demand. 
Leibniz's argument, as we have been reminded repeatedly in this conference, is entirely a priori. I want to put it this way. It doesn't touch the ground on which we live. This makes the understanding of evils more like what it was before the discourse of theodicy, when God's existence was not in doubt in reflections on these questions. Rather, the meaning of each of the three legs of the theodicy trilemma, which Bale revived, which Susan mentioned yesterday, omnipotence, omnibenevolence, and the existence of evil. Um, the meaning of each of these three legs um, could not be mutually inconsistent, as they appeared to be. One approached the problem, as Marilyn McCord Adams put it some time ago, apparetically as generating a puzzle. It is consistent with a mixture of defensive and probabilistic proofs offered in the theodicy, theodicy and the variety of erratic gestures accommodating various philosophical and especially theological opinions about, about the nature of evil to see Leibniz as continuing this aporetic project. But this popular book, the DUDC, is not, I think, an invitation to philosophy. It is for the empowering of practice, pulling together materials for a robust fatum Christianum. And I'm very grateful that Genevieve has already very eloquently taken us through the Mahometan, Stoic, and Christian fatum discussion. This means understanding ourselves as working for a master whose values we share, who shares our values, indeed one whose power, wisdom, and freedom we should imitate in as much as we participate in them. Our place is not at God's side, assessing and comparing worlds, as if we could. We have our own place, our own little sphere, acting out our best guess at God's will. God has chosen the best of all possible worlds, but that does strictly limited work here, and as much by what it doesn't let us say as by what it says. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. The preface makes it clear that Leibniz's TODC is addressed to a moment in practice, not in theory. Specifically, it is the moment when we have done what we have every reason to think is God's will, but have met with failure. Imagine I reach out to help someone in distress, only to see her torn away from me by a wave. This is the moment, Leibniz thinks, when our confidence in God is thrown in crisis, and not just in God, our powers to discern and act are thrown into crisis as well. The world we thought we knew cracks open. The way we are called to act in it suddenly seems mysterious, unconvincing. This is the moment when skepticism sidles in. It's the moment when voluntarism offers its baby-killing bathwater. It is the moment where the oblivion promised by the hashish of the lazy sophism seems most tempting and the moment when libertinism winks across the room at us. It is at such moments as these that we feel most alienated by and from the will of God, and wonder if his goodness is like ours, and if our freedom is anything more than a cruel charade. Leibniz would say it's also the moment when we become most estranged from our own nature. Too many interpreters of Leibniz's TODC think that Leibniz's position is like that of the Stoics, in an at once grim and glib statement that what, that what must be, must be. It seems the very worst form of what we can call an aesthetic or a bigger picture theodicy. The argument that there is more at stake than you can ever know, so be a good child and just don't complain. But Leibniz discusses the lazy sophism in theodicy as in every one of its predecessor works precisely because there is no way to apply any a priori view to the theater of action. This applies no less to the monodology than to the best of all possible worlds argument. To replace the metaphor of the labyrinth with something more dynamic, I see both of them as no more than trampolines which break a fall and return us to the level where the question arose and where action for us is possible. Maybe it's not a very good metaphor because I guess we fall back down again, but maybe you can bounce up and keep going, right? A different version of Récrulé pour mieux sauter, better sauter in any case. The lazy sophism arises at moments when action is hard to choose and offers the illusion that we could abdicate responsibility for our own lives and the worlds of which we are a part. The conclusion we are to draw from that discussion is that we should not think about God's will, but do it. Don't be Don José, be Pombal. My whole reading here comes from a single line, actually from a single parenthetical observation in the preface, but I do find it confirmed in other places. Trusting in providence, Leibniz like says, in reality occurs only when one has done one's duty. A few pages earlier he writes, before he declares his will by the event, one endeavors to find it out by doing that which appears most in accord with his commands. And then, whether one succeeds therein or not, one is content with what comes to pass, being once resigned to the will of God and knowing that what he wills is best. This resignation, which is the Fatum Christianum, is as different from the fatalist resignation which doesn't try to act or convinces itself that virtue must be its own reward as Christianity is from Stoicism. 
So we don't try to think out what God's will in the particular case is. We try to do it, and then from the effect we learn what happened. Leibniz neither seeks nor promises a definitive answer to the question of God's will in the particular instance, even after we have done our duty. I cannot show you this in detail, he says in Theodicy section 10, for can I know and can I present infinities to you and compare them together, but you must judge with me ab effectu, since God has chosen this world as it is. The sufficient reason for the permission of any evil is something we must find a way to do without. This does not mean we should not try to make sense of it. World creation involves the making of a usable past, though we understand it to be that, rather than a reading of the mind of God. It turns out we are capable of keeping several such interpretations in our quiver, as many, to use a word I learned yesterday, as our parallel practices require. What must at all costs be avoided, however, is affirming past evils as if they had been God's will, in a positive way, rather than permissions. This would twist our faith against our best understanding of what's good and cripple us as imitators of God. What then is our duty? When I last thought about these things, rather long ago, a long time ago, it seemed simple enough. God's presumptive will, which we should strive to effect through our actions, is his antecedent will to realize every possible good and to repel every possible evil. But it's not that straightforward, since in acting we must ourselves make choices, think through incompossibilities at every turn. We form consequent wills out of incompossible antecedent wills all the time, just as God did. Justice requires wisdom as well as charity for just this reason, because discernment and dis because, because such discernment and decision is constantly required. <coughs> That's why Leibniz calls us to be little gods. And also why the best of all possible worlds argument makes sense to us. We know from personal experience the happy necessity of the choice of the best. Science, natural as well as political, can help us better understand compossibilities and incompossibilities, and so more wisely administer the parts of the world in which we have power. Metaphysical theories about the nature of necessity may help on a few occasions, but not on most. Nevertheless, our aggregation of antecedent wills, even if expertly done, will be incomplete in comparison to those performed by God, and so stand in relation to God's final decree as an antecedent will does to the consequent. As ever for Leibniz, a distinction in practice reveals a continuum. And as the lived religion crowd might predict, it's all about human-sized worlds. Leibniz's TODC is all about justifying our place in our own smaller worlds, as we imitate a God whose nature we share, differing from ours only in its infinity. Leibniz is not just a bigger picture view, of course. The argument that this is the best of all possible worlds takes you decisively beyond that. It affirms the value of things that don't happen. It affirms the value of things which do not fit into this world, such as the long lives of children who die, people who die in childhood, the long happy life of Lucretia, who in our world is the victim of Sextus Tarquinius, or of the person who we tried to save but was swept away by a wave. Our world does not accommodate every possible good but this does not make their goodness chimerical, illusory, or irrelevant. Indeed, Leibniz conjures up so many good possibilities which cannot be accommodated that Ortega y Gasset saw in the best of all possible worlds view the origins of a nihilistic existentialism. Our little world for all its splendor seems in constant danger of being overwhelmed by the dark matter of other possible worlds of true but never to be realized goods. This was not Leibniz's intention, of course, but neither, neither was it for us to think that we could do the world comparing work ourselves, settle the final decree, and simply accept the world with a happy necessity. From our perspective, the world must seem tragic. I've argued elsewhere that the lazy sophism makes let's live in the best of all possible worlds simply impossible as a maxim for us. We can't know what constitutes its bestness. Indeed, we can't know any of the ways in which it departs from God's antecedent will with respect to anything we encounter in thought or reflection or experience. Deliberation about action, like discussion of the significance of events, is a scanning not of this world alone, but of possible worlds, one of which we know not yet which is the actual one. So we act to try and figure out which we think it is, see if we're right or wrong. To the extent that we are acting, which we always should be, we are adding our labor to possible worlds of good, many of which turn out not to be the actual final choice of God. This isn't something which happens only occasionally. It is what it means for us to act, recognizing and pursuing goods, and striving to redress evils. The ethical life involves the scanning of possible, not just actual worlds. 
So the actual as opposed to neighboring possible worlds has no claim on us in action. We can't tell them apart at that stage. Likewise, the past of the actual world has no decisive claim on us either. That a wave swept away the last person I tried to rescue does not mean I should have tried to rescue the next one. Although it might also mean that I should team up with some others and build a seawall. Recall Leibniz's response to William King, who had said that it was our job to accommodate ourselves to God's plan. I quote this from section 26. Kant says, right, uh, King says rightly, that in order to be happy, we must adapt our choice to things, since things are scarcely prone to adapt themselves to us. And that this is, in effect, adapting oneself to the divine will, says Leibniz. Doubtless, that is well said, he continues, but it implies besides that our will must be guided as far as possible by the reality of the objects and by true representations of good and evil. So Leibniz is not really agreeing with King at all. He is not counseling anything like the stoic resignation to the way of the world, which King seems to be enjoining. <laughs> Instead, Leibniz raises important new questions which interrupt the progress of a simple resignation. What is the true reality of things? How do we acquire true representations of good and evil in this or any other situation? It is to these questions, and not just to the way the world seems to us to be, that we must accommodate ourselves. Only in anchoring ourselves in these truths, which are truths not only restricted to the actual world, but to all possible worlds of good, it is to these um, that we must accommodate ourselves. Only in anchoring ourselves in these truths can we transcend a stoic fatum and achieve Christian joy. As Leibniz implies here and makes explicit elsewhere, we are often wrong about these things mistaken about what objects really are and what is real in them. The whole idea that evil is privation of good is a diagnosis of that problem. And we are plagued by misrepresentations of good and evil. This just means that we should try harder shouldering the responsibilities of the little god and perhaps collaborating with every other little god we can find to pool our knowledge and get a deeper understanding of the situation. This is the point at which Leibniz's theodicy, theodicy is least like uh, an 18th century theodicy and the place where his anti-voluntarism really pulls its weight. People have been saying that God knows best for years. It's also the to hand theology, theodicy of choice in everyday life, the locus for consolation and empowering reinterpretation. But it's never just whatever is is right, never just God knows what he's doing, never just everything happens for a reason. In practice, these claims are part of a discourse of alternate interpretations and scenarios resolutely committed to doing good and avoiding evil, one which takes the actual world God has chosen into account as it discloses itself to us in time, but never accepts a, ver a version of it as the final word on a broader question of justice or future action. It's all in the subjunctive mode, not the declarative. It works within the theater in which we are able to act, not the great theater of the striving possible. Even when we see God's consequent choice was not for the goods we strove for, we still don't really know what's going on. This goes for every good, too, of course, including ourselves, another way to trace existentialism back to Leibniz. Leibniz's TODC defines and protects that space of interpretations and ventures required for ethical action, that space in which we navigate in thought and action and discussion with others among the possible worlds which are closest to us. It is to be defended against skeptical and voluntarist views which orphan us or saddle us with a god understood as a tyrant, but also against the kind of physical theology which would, through Christian Wolff, be associated with Leibniz's name later in the 18th century. It does this by directing us to the human-sized world we know, not whole possible worlds, including this actual one, which we are unable to grasp. To put it bluntly, only God can comprehend possible worlds as wholes, let alone compare them. Our task is not to learn to judge as God does. Assessing and comparing worlds, that is something we cannot do on the level of worlds but we can do it at our own scale. It is to learn to act as God does in promoting goods and preventing evils in our own world, because in our own world, we can do it. If we are right about the realities of good and evil, our acts are good. They are God's will. This doesn't mean that they will all meet with success, but enough of them, I imagine, will do so. When they don't, we defer to God along the lines of what Jerry Schneewin once called the divine corporation view. We defer to God on the provinces we don't understand, um, devote ourselves to the places we can. We feed the living, but we also bury the dead. So I'm almost done. I grant it is a stretch to link life as trampolining us back from the comparison of world's level to our own little worlds, on the one hand, and the work of world creation emphasized by scholars of lived religion, on the other. It is a stretch, I think, but only a small one. 
Think again of Leibniz as a religious unifier. The author of the TODC imagines his readers Lutheran, Calvinist, Catholic, Russian, Chinese, and Mohammedan, even skeptical and stoic. He doesn't want to change their views about those. All of these worlds are good worlds from which to do our duty or to start deliberating about it. Most, of course, are already asserting that this is the best of all possible worlds in their own views, although they might need Leibniz's help to make it explicit to them. We don't need to agree about the big theological questions to agree about what's right in the particular situation. But we also would do well to be aware of this fact, aware that we don't need to agree, aware that is that differences of doctrine and ritual just don't matter that much or shouldn't if we are doing our duty and might actually have a positive role to play in the, enact in the enablement of action among different people. Allow me to connect the last two dots of my argument very fast and then I'll stop. Maria Rosa Antoniazza has reminded us that Leibniz was a faithful citizen of the Holy Roman Empire, an endless and self-calibrating balancing act of principalities large and small, all differently constituted, not the emerging state system christened at the Treaties of Westphalia. Might not Leibniz's rejection of the emerging political discourse of theodicy be seen as grounded in that experience? His understanding of the charge of little gods so his understanding of the charge of little gods certainly to me seems to be based in that experience and quite different thus from the terrifying idea of a chaos of jostling mini sun kings. If Bayer and others are right, and if I'm right in extending their arguments to the changing fortunes of the discourse of theodicy, Leibniz's structure resisting big picture theodicy for the more engaged work of world making on our own human scale may have a day in the sun again. In the new world emerging as nation states and secularization theories subside, experiences and conceptions of religion tied to the Westphalian settlement subside with them. New theories of religion are emerging which are not about the meaning of the world as a whole, attitudes toward the world in vaguer sense, the problem of evil understood as a comparative category, vast sacred canopies supported and supporting, supporting and supported by discrete social and political communities. Instead, we find theories of crossing and dwelling, of negotiating transnational and virtual experiences, and of the building of religious worlds from the ground up, religious action, not spectatorship, inherently pluralistic, experimental, and lived. Leibniz's TODC and his contributions more generally may find a warmer reception here than they did in the heyday of the discourse of theodicy. I conclude, I have barely begun to answer the questions I have raised, but I hope I have at least made a case for the questions. Is Leibniz a supporter of lived religion? Probably not, but a Leibnizian could be, and could see in its insistence on world creating at every level something like the world Leibniz speaks to and from, and some of what appeals to us about it. Does lived religion need a metaphysics? Probably not, but it could use a friend who sees the philosophical merit of its pluralistic resilience, as well as the need for a horizon never reached of ultimate consolation. And have we done right by the dead of Lisbon? At least we have not folded them into a theodicy. Thank you. Is it you? Yes. Um, we have five minutes for questions. So please cut. It's going. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was a little surprised, Mark, given where you want to end up with Leibniz being in some way useful to this project, uh, that you said that there was general agreement that Leibniz's arguments were a priori, um, because uh, I think there may be deep division in this room oh, okay. about that. Um, so as I see it, uh, Leibniz cannot rely, Leibniz makes the a priori argument, we, Andrew put up very nicely on the PowerPoint this morning, that because the world is a creation of God, it must be morally and metaphysically the best. That's an a priori argument. But we don't have an a priori argument that God's standards of the morally and metaphysically best are ours. And Without that argument, we're just going to end up with the inscrutable God creating the world that God likes and considers best, but it's got nothing to do with us. To get the Odyssey, we need a match between us and God. I think the only way Leibniz can get that is through physical theology, through our seeing that what God thinks is beautiful and orderly is like what we think of as beautiful and, and orderly. So 
He's got to do that. The argument has got to be heavily a posteriori, also as opposition to Spinoza. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps being a little more friendly to physical theology would help you get back into the lived world rather than treating Leibniz as a purely a priori theorist of the good. Thank you. Um, I don't want to go that way. Um, because I see physical theology as bankrupting itself and leading into the philosophy of history that causes all the problems we heard about um, on Tuesday. Um, and because my, my sense which my, my sense of the local context in which all these things happen is confined to a, a space of action, I wonder whether the a posteriori arguments aren't better provided by the experience of action than of contemplation or of observation. So yes, observing function in organisms, observing beauty and harmony in nature, these are very nice, but you're right, they won't actually tell us that this is a good world. They might tell us that it's a well-organized world. They certainly won't tell us that it's the best world. Um, I think there is something um, in our own experience of pursuing the good and seeing the good unfold through our own participation that gives us, um, it's, it is a posterior experience. Um, Yes, I, I but, think but, but, we agree. I think it, that, it's, I, it's I, a posterior experience, but I want to say it doesn't. It, it's it's episodic. Yes, I, I, it, I, it, I, it doesn't add up to the kind of larger, big picture view which I think Leibniz is trying to. Yeah, imagine. I don't think we should revive physical theology or or mm -hmm. philosophy of history, either. But just getting away from the a priori. I don't think you should accept that view that Leibniz's arguments are a priori, okay. mm -hmm. or the good ones. <laughs> the, ones he sees them, the ones he thinks are important. Well, well actually, I, 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 I thought they were a priori for a while. I mean, Ortega y Gasset already makes that argument. So, um, and that sort of struck me as the best way to defend Leibniz at a certain stage in my own relationship with him. That, well, of course, he didn't mean to answer any particular question. It was sort of a category error to ask him about any particular case, like the earthquake in Lisbon or any other sort of thing. Um, and I guess, and, and I think the understanding to which I've come now is that it needs to be a priori because it needs to be a horizon. It leaves him vulnerable, I think, the a posteriori approach, but it's the only way to get away from the powerful arguments of Spinoza for the ethically neutral universe. Mm -hmm. I think. But you get the last word, you're the speaker. No, no, I can give you the last word. <laughs> There's a passage in the discourse on metaphysics where Leibniz seems to suggest that God's creation, combining the greatest possible variety with non-contradiction, is reenacted by the formulation of good scientific hypotheses yeah. which do yeah. exactly that. Would it be a fair drawing out the upshot or approach to uh, using Leibniz in this way as regarding the metaphysics for the liberty of religion, to suggest that it's a modelling of human response to mm -hmm. catastrophe, disappointment, failure, good efforts, etc., on God's creative agency in accommodating the evil into a good response to create a better world. Would that be a, a fair way of capturing the, the appropriation of the metaphysics? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Um, and following on from that, yes. I'm just trying to get a bit more content to the, the idea of post-secularism in this okay. context. What exactly does this offer as an alternative to the, the secularization of discourse of it. I mean, I can see that it has certain implications for getting away from organized religion as, as, mm -hmm. as having, having one's responses to catastrophe channeled through organized religion into an alternative kind of approach which doesn't carry presumptions about religious belief. It might even be neutral between atheists and religious believers of any kind. Is that the direction in which you want to take this, or is there there's something else about the, the relating mm -hmm. your approach to a dissatisfaction with the discourse of secularization? 
I, I guess I see secularization as itself the Odyssey 5.0, or one of these later versions of uh, it's it's an account about the necessary passing through a stage of illusion or mistake of religious kinds that then leads us to the discovery of our actual true situation and how we ought to act in it. Um, I guess somewhat along the lines of what Susan was talking about. Um, and I take the failure of secularization theory to say that, well, actually, most people didn't before, didn't during, and don't now actually think about the world as a whole. That when they were thinking about the world as a whole religiously, they were actually speaking from the experience of bounded religious communities that were politically held in place. Um, and so, secular, just as, as Latour says, we've never been modern. I don't think we've ever been secular. Um, I think that there is um, a pluralism that comes from a grounded reflection, both in trying to understand the world and act in it, um, that Leibniz speaks for quite eloquently, that harmonizes with those kinds of practices that live religion scholars are now attending to, some of whom say this is a postmodern thing, a post-secular thing, and some of whom say, well, this probably is kind of like what's been happening everywhere all the time. Um, the questions that take the form of, is this world good enough? Um, what is the good anyway? What does it mean to be human? Am I free? Um, who is God? Who is God to me? Who am I to God? But those are questions that arise in particular settings and are then addressed in, in action, in experiment, in hypothesis. Um, and that we know that about each other. I don't know if that addresses the question. Ursula, Samuel, Colin, and Brandon. I just wanted to make the argument that Leibniz does actually something like living religion okay. by writing the theodicy, because I think mm -hmm. that is what he uh, did in order to defend Christianity against, you know, to build a firewall against Spinoza. And just because he found Spinoza absolutely convincing, he had to find something to put against, and that is living religion, I think. And he did it for the glory of God. I, I take him to be a very convinced Christian. Mm -hmm. And so the other point is also that he took his work, and that is what, what I also put as objected yesterday to Susan, uh, when she said that, uh, that the best word is just a good word, or everything is right. He worked more than, for example, Kant, but even than Voltaire to improve this world, right? All his activities to improve things in medicine, in the state, in, in um, the economics of a state, uh, to found academies, etc., etc. That is all work in the glory of God. That is how he considered himself, right? So in this way, I would definitely see that metaphysics is for him absolutely important and part of this lived religion because it guarantees for those who are in doubt that the whole thing still works. So and on the other hand, I would also give a more practical example. He is very supportive in the beginnings of pietism. Mm -hmm. To pietism, he has a correspondence with Franke. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, before it becomes dogmatic itself or you know suppressive itself, when it is still <clears throat> emphasizing the lived religion against orthodox controversies. Mm -hmm so that you should rather care. And then the whole emphasis of love in religion, that is definitely also in favor of lived religion in Leibniz himself. Uh, thank you very much, especially for the, uh, the reference to the, the relationship with pietism. I will follow that up. Otherwise, you just made the argument I didn't have the nerve to more than suggest, but it is what I was trying to, that was, that was the original thought behind this paper that there, there is a way in which all of Leibniz's work is part of this improvement project, including the philosophical work. Um, and understanding it in terms of lived religion, I think, illuminates that. So. Oh, th thanks, Mark, for the paper. Um, I find myself agreeing so much with it that this is a uh, awkwardly, embarrassingly friendly question, so I apologize for that as well. Um, I mean, you might think that there's there's kind of a threat to, well, there's various threats that even participants in religious communities have seen to live religion, and that occasionally these threats rise to a certain level such that 
uh, they themselves need defeat, so we need to defeat the potential defeaters, as it were. Uh, and did you might even think that uh, some of the responses, some of these uh, scholars of religion who are staring down this secularization myth that itself looks as much like you know, wishful thinking as they accuse uh, religious folks of engaging in, uh, are doing just that, right? And so why not, I mean, in the way I think you're bringing this up, but isn't this a way of reading what Leibniz is doing in the more dogmatic elements of the theodicy, the more a priori, these kind of ones, seeing the threats of, on the one hand, the spinacist, on the other hand, the sort of Baileyan types, um, on the other hand, some of the more voluntaristic ones, sort of saying, look, um, to, relig to live religion, there are threats in the air, and they need a kind of defeat. And so that, as it were, wing, as Paul says, of the theodicy is engaged in a kind of defeat of defeaters to therefore just make space for uh, the kind of uh, live religion. Is, is that a fair way of characterizing some of the more dogmatic aspects of the theodicy that are very speculative, very a priori, and very yes. certain? Yes. And, and I guess I just want to try and connect that again to that moment when the trust in providence is frustrated by the fact that my attempt to understand the act of God, the will of God through action has been frustrated by failure, which um, in, the, in the preface he talks more about the libertines and about the, um, the skeptics and about uh, the lazy sophism and others. I think that those are all, uh, that, that, that voluntarism appeals to um, a theist at those moments. And it's kind of a moment in when somehow things are, aren't working at all the way in which I thought God meant for them to do so. And so, well, not your way, but my way. Um, so that there are good reasons why people would be tripped up at that point, um, and good reasons we could imagine why they might then fall into the error of voluntarism, or where others would then say, well, obviously, I don't understand what God's talking about with the veil direction. Um, I haven't thought as much about the Spinoza's challenge, so I'll need to, to work on that some more. But um, yes, that's my understanding of the. So some, some of the tools in the toolkit of the, of the theodicy are specifically for those philosophical um, engagements. But, um, and part of that is the public defense of whatever you take to be right against the, uh, the opponents of that view. But I, again, want to sort of bring it back to the private theater of somebody whose engagement and agency in the world has been tripped up by doubts that they are unable to put, put, put to rest. Thanks. Um, this is, I think, mostly just a clarificatory question. Um, but you talked a lot about using Leibniz to provide a metaphysics for lived religion. Mm -hmm. And I just want to press you a little bit on what exactly that means. Because it seems like there might be an ambiguity here. Like, there are two things that lived religion um, is being used to refer to. On the one hand, it's being referred to a particular way of studying religion. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how you first introduced the idea of political religion. It's kind of this like new trend among historians to focus on the experiences and practices of individuals rather than the larger institutions. So one thing you might think is that that methodology needs some kind of metaphysical support. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, providing a metaphysics for religion could mean something like providing a metaphysics for the people on the ground, for the people living in religion. And I th think that you're more interested in the latter, but I'm not yes. totally yeah. sure. Yes. OK. <laughs> and, 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 and I would, I, life's too long to try and go to a bunch of historians and tell them that they really need metaphysics to do their work. <laughs> um, but, but, but if I wasn't clear about that, thank you for, for clarifying it. It's, um, to me, it, it remains uh, an open question whether at the level of lived experience for the people who were doing it, um, they would recognize uh, metaphysics as a friendly, um, helpful thing at all. And whether making it explicit is something that would have much use, much, much function for them in the practice of so doing. Um, and here, I, th I guess one of the reasons why I'm drawn back to Leibniz and thinking about these questions is I think that Leibniz is perhaps over generous hermeneutic of hearing the best of all possible worlds argument and just about any claim anybody's made about anything um, isn't a way of saying you have to replace your way of formulating that with this best of all possible worlds argument. There is, in fact, a, a philosophical demonstration of it if you need it. Um, but I wonder whether
I haven't persuaded myself yet that the lived religion thinks it needs a metaphysics. I think in some sense, um, actually, this actually this is a good question. Then back to the the scholar of lived religion, the scholar of lived religion who's trying to understand what it is that stabilizes this creation of worlds, because it can seem otherwise like it is a pretty haphazard process that might very easily veer in one direction or another on the basis of contingencies and who you happen to meet and what books happen to be on your shelf and what, what kind of misfortunes happen to arise for you, that if there is something that stabilizes it, that um, maybe they are looking beyond the reasons given by people or even their conscious intentions um, such as they are at some, at some more basic understanding about the way the world works, which could be called the metaphysics. So I guess I have to be a little more aggressive um, because my question has been preempted again a little bit. Um, but uh, this is following up Colin's uh, question or point, and, but let me just phrase it in a slightly different way because I thought I understood uh, all that you were saying in your talk and I found it very interesting. Um, and then just in your peroration, you said, eh, does theodicy uh, need metaphysics? Nah, not so much. And then also with what you're saying to Collins, I, I'm a little mm -hmm. confused, so can I just ask you just on a simple level what you understand metaphysics to be and how you could have a theodicy without one? And I, I just don't understand, where you understand why you're trying to say that or what it means okay. to say that. Well, in my text, it didn't say probably not. It said perhaps not, and then I went down at the end. I just thought it would be more dramatic to say probably not. But, um, but that doesn't answer your question. Um, I guess what I mean by metaphysics would be some sense that the nature of the world is such that the apparent chaos or moral disaster of a situation that we find ourselves is not indicative of the overall trend of things. That our judgment that something about the situation, that our judgment that something is amiss is in fact anchored in some deeper truth about the way the world is. Enough? No. Okay, I guess, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a very popular sort of version of it, but. Okay, okay. Mm. I, I, well, no, I, mean, I, I would have. No, no, please, please. Oh, okay. uh, I'll also just a brief follow on to his question. Um, just the um, lived religion. Um, you're talking. You seem to be talking about it as if it's a unitary thing. You know, so the lived religion for a scholar such as me, you know, uh, does does involve um, the the need for metaphysics. And I would think for a lot of thoughtful people who see. Um, uh, the scientific worldview is at least providing a partial metaphysics that mm -hmm. could potentially be thought of as threatening. So, just there's a whole range of experiences, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So, so you're right. Yes, I did. I did talk about lived religion, and I have a tendency, even to sort of, as I think I did in response to, to, to Genevieve's question, to say, "Oh, lived religion. In fact, it's all religion that's ever happened. Even the moderns who didn't realize what they were doing." Um, so there is. Um, there's an overreaching um, in some theorizing about lived religion, which I'm guilty of sometimes, but, but the corrective is, is welcome. Um, I guess the next step would be, I mean, what's interesting to me is whether there is in fact in lived religion a kind of a tolerance for a celebration of pluralism, of metaphysics. Whether that's one of, that's one of the things I think I've, I've sort of taken from some of these other scholars, that it's not just that people um, take religion into their hands or take a metaphysics into their hands. And you're right, for many people, metaphysical views are very important as part of that. Um, but that they're aware that other people take things in their hands in different ways. And that there's got to be some kind of an understanding of why that's OK. And why you're taking things up in your hands in a different way than the way I do is still somehow rather compatible with my taking it up in my way being doing the work for me that I need it to do, as anchoring me as a, as a moral and, and intellectual being. Oh. That is over. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.